OK, so we're back again um, and um, this is part two. Um, and if you haven't looked at our introduction, please do so, because um, that sort of sets the scene for this scenario session. So, um, yeah, do you want to have a bit of a intro to why you came up with this idea of scenarios, Rich, in terms of thinking about BNG? Uh... I haven't copyrighted this, have I? Maybe I should have done. Yeah. <laughs> no, this this was, I think, in all honesty, this was how I ended up making sense of it for myself. Yeah. And I and I struggled actually quite a long time, and I because I agreed that I was going to try to make the kind of the roadmap and you know the kind of explain how it all worked, and it was only. Mm. When I've kind of tried and failed to make a single roadmap, I realised that I was actually trying to do something that was undoable because actually there were several separate things that that could go on. Uh, so yeah, so I don't know if your scenario is actually the best word, but at, at the heart of it, it, it basically is about um, before you sort of talk about any of the detail of can we insist what what should we expect to see at validation and actually like that basic kind of question what's the mm. starting point for receiving an application yeah. and actually it, you kind of uh, it's a legitimate question but I think the answer is annoyingly it depends because it depends on what you what you're trying to do and so I've drawn up three separate scenarios that and they work each of them works quite differently so in mm. some ways the answer to the question what should I expect to see at validation is well which scenario is this are you working to sort of to achieve and this is I guess a message that's relevant for developers as well as LPAs so I think there are three separate things going on one of which is what do you do when you want to establish and secure a habitat bank yeah and people have kind of been asking questions about what can someone define a habitat bank is that a helpful question yeah I think so um so I think there is a bit of confusion out there. I would say that, as ever, I'm very keen to promote our Frequently Asked Questions page, which I would suggest people look at. And we do have an answer to uh, what a Habitat Bank is there. I mean, basically, it's where someone, someone, an organisation, um, and that can be a business, it might be a farmer, um, it might be a landowner, it might be a uh, wildlife trust or someone like that, has either a, a piece of land or a number of pieces of land. So a big example of this would be the Environment Bank, where they have a, a large number of pieces of land. They may not own those, but they are working, in some cases, working with the landowner. Um, and they're basically creating habitats in advance um, to create biodiversity units on those. So they have gone away and measured the uh, biodiversity value of the land to start with and then they have done some work and they're continuing to do some work to, to create to create some habitats that generates uh, biodiversity units which is kind of the currency of uh, BNG um, so yeah so the point is that they have probably got some funding up front to do that work um, and then what how they recoup that funding is they will then go and sell those units to a developer who needs BNG units to meet the 10%. So that's the kind of model that they have. Um, but there's some quite different, you know, kind of different people doing that. But essentially, that's what it is. And um, alongside those folks that I just mentioned that might be doing that, it may also be something that a local authority might want to do on their own estate. And we'll get into that. But yeah, that's essentially what a Habitat Bank is. Thank you. And then there's two versions that involve planning applications. So I suppose because the point there is there isn't a planning application required to set up a habitat bank and I think no. we might labour that point in a moment yes. then there's two things where there is a planning application uh, there's a development that provides its own uplift uh, or a development that buys its uplift and then so these these are kind of like you know training models aren't they uh, and there will be many situations where an application might provide some of its own uplift and it might make up the balance by buying its uplift and so they might not fit into only one scenario but I think as long as you understand how it works in across these across these kind of streams then you can understand whether you're jumping across the stream and doing this because you're now in scenario three as opposed to scenario two I think I think without understanding the kind of the three you you will never be able to understand how how they present kind of in concert 
So I've kind of broken out each scenario into two bits. Uh, sometimes there's an important difference and sometimes there isn't. But I think particularly at the moment, there is a difference between private providers and council providers, council land providers. Um, and then I think we've got two versions of a development providing its own gain. Either it can do it on site or it can do it by using, we're calling it a linked site. I don't think that's a kind of defined term, is it? It just basically means at planning application stage, a, an applicant comes forward with a red line site and then with a separate site when it says, I control this site and this is where the where the gains are going to go. And then lastly, there's a development that buys its gain from, as we were talking about, one of these providers, one of these habitat banks, and it could be off-site units and as a last resort, uh, national credits. Which I always confuse and annoys yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's worth just quickly saying that that. So just to sort of really draw out, there are these three options for doing BNG. So you can do it on site, which is within the red line boundary of your site. Um, now, in some cases, that's going to be quite easy to get to ten percent. But obviously, what you're talking about is you've got a baseline, so what's already on the site, and then you're going above and beyond that. But a lot of development, that's going to be really hard because you're developing the site. So whatever's on there is going to. Um, so um, and then another another option is to go uh, to, to look off site. So and um, the yeah, and that can, as, as it says there, that can be bought either by sort of arranging that off site yourself or by buying units. And then there is this last resort, th this last resort to meet BNG need that is a credit scheme that's being run by Natural England. So it's important to know that. Another thing that's really important to know is for off site units, there is a register that is being run by Natural England at a national level. Now, to get those units on the register and to be compliant with legal, legally compliant with BNG, you have to secure those, those units for 30 years. And the only two ways you can secure them, that's all that's allowed under the Environment Act, this is going back to the legal requirements, are through, through a Section 106 planning obligation or something new called a Conservation Covenant. We don't have conservation covenants yet, but so at the moment, the only route to securing those. So basically any of these off site options all require a section 106 at the moment. And that sort of covers why some of this gets a little bit complicated and we get questions about it. So I think that's helpful to explain now. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose I'd, I'd put that slightly differently, which is section 106 is get banded about as if they're only ever doing one job. And that's the job yeah. we're used to them doing and actually yeah. There's a new version of them in town. Now. Yes. And yeah. that I think has really kind of got people at sea, which is why we've put it in yellow here. Yeah. So so here we are. We've got these three scenarios. Let's walk mm -hmm. through each of the scenarios and then we're going to kind of put them in a, in a nice little summary table. So some of this I think that you've you've already said. So you can it's a bank of habitat units units. It took me a while to work out actually that point that you were saying is that they can already have been made. Like you could start yeah. a year ago and, and effectively improve habitats, take crappy farmland, make it nice and bank them and keep them there for when someone is prepared to buy them. It doesn't have to be contemporaneous with the planning application. Probably an obvious thing, but it took me a while to work it out. Um, in a very few situations, the establishment of the bank itself might require a planning application. Mm -hmm. um, if it involves, you know, constructing wetlands or forestry there might be other situations where there is like a uh, uh, an operation that requires a planning application but where it does it is bng exempt otherwise you'd go into this sort of doomed loop spiral forever wouldn't you yeah exactly the whole world would be, be covered in bng yeah um there's this this point about you have to register uh them via section 106 and uh this is a section 106 that isn't linked to a planning application it doesn't it's not part of the development management process. It might not even go into the development management department. It might go to the ecology department because they might be the ones who think they're better placed to judge uh, whether they uh, are happy to establish a bank in that place. Because you kind of want a bank in the right kind of place with the right kind of person. And we might say a bit more about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And then the last point is the point that you were making, Becky, which is at the moment, it's the Section 106 is the only game in town. 
conservation covenants don't exist, responsible bodies don't yet exist, which puts local authorities in a bit of a bind because you can't enter a section 106 with yourself. So at the moment, uh, they can't put their land into a habitat bank yet. So I think I think this is a point I'm, I'm happy to kind of lean into now. So uh, the point that you made, Becky, is that if you want, if you as a local planning authority want to be able to say to your developer community, OK, we accept that you, uh, there are times when you're going to want to go off site, but we don't want you to go off site to somewhere 100 miles away. We want you to keep the benefit local for the benefit of our communities. Um, you have to then allow that offsite market to occur by entering into a section 106 with providers. I hear and I hear direct from LPAs that many don't want to because they're slightly suspicious. They're not really interested. They don't really know why they should bother. I think some providers haven't helped themselves by just basically saying, well, here's this thing, sign it. I think if I was a provider, I would understand effectively not sure how much how further I, I want to go into this in a recording, but I think there is something about understanding that councils uh, culturally they start the section 106 process by someone saying, "I'll cover your costs, and here's a planning performance agreement to cover your costs of engaging with me." Basically, I'm not expecting the local ratepayer to subsidise the activity that I'm trying to do to establish a habitat bank. And I think some of them haven't really understood that that's the only way that those conversations sort of start. And then I think the point that we've both learned, Beck, is that actually if you get in there early, it's a chance to raise standards. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And and make that local market happen. You know, we, we talked in our introduction about how, um, you know, uh, how, you know, it's going to be if if the market isn't ready it's going to be a bit tricky for um you know to deliver bng locally so if you can do anything to help make that happen but also make sure you know if you can know that um units that are being sold locally are good quality that really helps because then you're you're having to hopefully do let fewer checks when it comes to the planning stage um so yeah um and as it says there we've got um We've got examples of uh, Section 106 is doing this um, and um, Buckinghamshire Council, for example, have, have sort of already set up a, a little, um, not a little, that sounds very patronising, a, a, a scheme for doing this, basically, where providers can come to them and pay them to um, set up um, a, a, an agreement for a Habitat Bank. So they've got that already running. So, um, but as we said in our introduction, we're going to be looking at sort of some sample Section 106 examples pulling on that that info so out there so far. Generic ones. Yeah, I'm absolutely happy to name check Bucks. They've been awesome throughout, haven't they? Yes, really, really excellent in terms of uh, what they're doing, but also being willing to share it, which is brilliant for us and our network. So, yeah. Absolutely. And then I think the other thing that I've learned uh, from David at Bucks is uh, I think that it's right and appropriate as a local planning authority that you do take a view about whether or not you're happy to see a bank be established in that place. You you do kind yeah. of want the right stuff in the right place and you want to be comfortable and confident that you've got a long term relationship because you know, these are long term arrangements, aren't they? Yeah, because it's got to be at least 30 years. So, you know, it, that's a long time to make a commitment. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Buckinghamshire have set up is they before they even start a conversation, they want certain tick boxes to be done, because I think what they found to begin with was landowners were coming and go, oh, yeah, we want to have this conversation and then taking up loads of time. And then it became apparent that they just didn't know what they were doing and were not set up at all. So I think that's been, you know, they've obviously been in a really helpful journey in terms of that and, you know, sharing their 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 experience so yeah super so you spoke about this in your introduction that uh councils you know councils own lots of land there's country parks there's lots of opportunities yeah. for betterment uh so and you know that that point about i can't remember is it 30 years 40 years 30 years 30 years yes 30 years, um, yeah. you know i think there are some people genuinely interested in kind of going we've got this thing we'd like to see uh, a better habitat on it and a 30 year kind of maintenance regime on it. it does it does feel you know from a landowner perspective quite quite tempting just as it does for yeah. kind of farmers and co in the short term this is tricky i mean mm -hmm. people are you know the creative brains in local authorities are starting to work out what their options are 
if you're a district council, you can enter a section 106 with your county council. I've mm -hmm. not heard of anyone doing that, but I think legally you can. Yeah. A couple of special purpose vehicles have cropped up. So there's one in Norfolk, one in Plymouth, yes. I know. Yeah. yeah. In time, uh, conservation covenants will happen and some councils I know are thinking about becoming responsible bodies and you might find a network of responsible bodies uh, entering into conservation covenants with each other I guess mm -hmm. kind of mutual trust or indeed you might kind of cede control of the land out to an environmental trust for 30 years and then enter into a, a legal agreement with them I mean from my perspective I think I hope that this will get fixed because councils are exactly the kind of long term organisations that you want to have as kind of stakeholders in this process. Yeah, exactly. And, and this last point, which um, I think I've added to this slide, is I think there is a sort of people aren't really starting because they can't really work out how to do it. I think for brave councils, if I can use that word, mm. you, you can follow the Environment Bank's model, which is to create gains at risk. Like there's no mm. guarantee that if they go in and they create these things that anyone will end up wanting to buy them. Mm. And you can, if you're a council, you can follow that line exactly. You can create gains and hope that in the fullness of time, someone will, will be able to buy them back off you. But actually, as a council, I think you're in quite a good position to judge supply and demand and to, and to manage your risk. And many, 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 well, there's no, there's no other game in town for most people at the moment. So I kind of leave that as a kind of this is something that you might want to think about. Yeah. And, you know, there are there are other ways to look into that as well. So some places are doing these sort of supply and demand, you know, to test it out, I guess, to, to sort of understand what that risk might be, which I think is really helpful. So um, just to plug another thing that we've got is um, we've got a readiness checklist, which sort of goes through the actions you might want to take. And that talks about some of these things. Um, in terms of some activities, in terms of getting involved in BNG. We're just in the process of updating that now to fit in with this. But yeah, it's worth bearing in mind that that might be, you know, that may help you understand the local market a bit better if you have that sort of do a bit of supply and demand work. So that's scenario one, yes. setting up a habitat bank. <clears throat> We're now in scenario two, where, you know, this process kicks off with a planning application or pre-application advice. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just walk us through this bit? Yeah. So yeah. So you've got a planning application, um, and then the developer will, uh, well, what they should be doing as part of that sort of process of developing uh, their plans is uh, to, in the first stage, uh, avoid impacts on habitats on the site, and then um, then they'd start thinking about where they can't avoid those. Right. Um, are they going to look to provide the biodiversity net gain on site? Um, and then if they can't do that, um, what what do they need to do off site? And it may be that they have some land uh, nearby or elsewhere that they control. So it might be that they own it as a developer or it may be that they are working with a landowner to own that. Um, I guess an important point here is that um, we get some queries sometimes about the blue line boundary. Um, that definitely counts as off-site in BNG. So if it's outside the red line boundary, it's definitely off-site. Um, a an important thing to bear in mind here as well, uh, just to add a little bit more complication because that's what we like to do, is that not the what we like to do. No, not what you like to do. It's it's what uh, is out there. Um, is the Environment Act. Um, so so basically. Biodiversity net gain needs to be secured for 30 years, but in the case of on-site biodiversity net gain, it only has to be legally, it as a, it's only a legal requirement to secure it for 30 years, um, if it is a significant increase on what was there before. And that is determined by the local authority. And we have done some work around this because there's a lot of questions about that. Um, and then for on-site, you can secure that uh, via Section 106 or condition. Um, and you yeah, you probably want to have a think about how you want to do that. Obviously, over time, you you will be able to use a conservation covenant as well if if that if that's one you want to go down. Um, I guess an important thing is, you know, there are pros and cons of both of those approaches. So section 106, you can include the monitoring fees. If this is going to be done for 30 years, you're going to need to do some checks potentially around whether it's actually being delivered. Um, but 
conditions are much easier to enforce and you can't include the monitoring fees. It's, it, again, we talk about this a little bit more in our deep dive on significant, you know, what, what route do you want to go down? How, how um, just really thinking about um, what, how much effort it's worth putting in really on this, I think. Um, and I guess the important thing to say is most of the time, so I guess, you know, we've talked already about the fact that BNG in its essence is a post-consent consideration. It, that's how it comes in through the Environment Act. But if you're talking about on-site biodiversity net gain or a linked site controlled by the applicant, you really probably need to deal with this gain at the consent moment because you'll need to get you're going to need to sort out whether you're doing a section 106 or condition obviously you can't do a condition post consent you could do a section 106 post consent actually and that might be applicable perhaps to the off-site option um but you'll need to have a condition in there that sort of covers that so so yeah so that's kind of um yeah a bit of a difference there in terms of the gains are dealt with at that stage is what we're thinking absolutely and then the last one, which I think is probably the most, well, for a start, it's the most simple. And also, I think over time, it's going to become the most common one, which is where developments buy their gain from a bank, possibly, where I think it, it is much less of a stretch to say BNG is basically dealt with post-consent. Gains are purchased uh, post-consent. It might be that you know, the developer wants to reserve them earlier and they'll definitely want to have an understanding of, you know, three units of X equals about, you know, five grand or 15 grand mm. or 150 grand, whatever the kind of final financial kind of cost is. And then in some ways, then the the discharge of the post consent condition is much simpler because actually it's not really about monitoring or habitats or whatever. It's did you buy the credits? From units, someone units, who, uh, units. It it's might be credits, but units, uh, units, probably units. units. It's never going to go in. I just have to accept that yeah. I'm 50-50. Anytime I say a word, it will be right or wrong. Did did you buy them? And did you buy them yeah. from a registered thing? And is it on the register? In which case, job done. It literally becomes a proof of purchase rather than the proof of anything environmental. And I think that, again, is something that people really haven't kind of got clear sight of that. Mm. And I guess the other thing, um, uh, is it worth just reinforcing the hierarchy points at this point? Just in terms of that, yes. that difference between units and credits? Yeah, so I think, so um, from a political point of view, and I guess an ecological point of view, and for sorts of other reasons, you know, giving benefit to local communities, generally you would prefer uh, biodiversity net gain to be um, as local as possible to where the biodiversity is being lost or where the, the impact's happening. Um, so the good thing is that actually that is inherent to how BNG works um, because the biodiversity metric which measures uh, BNG is basically designed to encourage local mitigation. So you get, um, they've, it's got these multipliers in there which basically if you um, if you're local to to where the loss is happening, it, it basically multiplies your number of units up. So you need fewer units than you would do if you went further away. Um, there is also a little bit of a nuance in there in terms of if your um, if you where you're providing the offsite units is in line with a local strategy, and in time that will be the local nature recovery strategy, which we mentioned earlier. Um, but it might be your green infrastructure strategy or some kind of other biodiversity strategy that also um, incentivizes that so that's really great, great to know um so basic so you, you you know you have to look at so a developer who's looking for off-site can't do it all on site looking for off-site they have to go local first well it's going to be cheaper for them to go local first it's yep. incentivized um then look at the national market and then the last resort is this national credit scheme now national credits are really super expensive so you know that's the way that is sort of incentivized both through the metric because you'd have to buy more units because they won't be local but also they they are priced deliberately to discourage um their use so yeah so it's kind of like there's this sort of fundamental principle about this um high the what's called the biodiversity gain hierarchy which is set out in the ppg around um on site then local off site then national market then national credits but that is actually incentivized through how the whole thing works so yeah, yeah. 
OK, thank you. So those were the scenarios that we've just walked through. Yeah. Let's try putting them. In a table. Hopefully we can kind of walk people through the table and they'll understand why we've done it like we've done it. So. There are these little swim lanes that we've kind of coloured at the same thing. So the top swim lane is where you are establishing a bank of. Units. That's the one. <laughs> Thank you. And though actually just, you know, actually no, let's ignore that rabbit hole. So you're establishing a bank of units. How are you going to secure it? You're going to secure it in the short term via section 106 only, but in the longer term conservation covenants will come into it. And in terms of monitoring and enforcement, uh, if you like proper operation of the site is going to be explained in the HMMP, which stands for the Habitat Monitoring and Management, Management and Monitoring, can't remember. Management the and that. Monitoring Plan, Management. that's the one, yeah. The HMMP, uh, and you're going to have, you know, if you like, powers of taking people to court and stuff if they don't do what they said that they were going to do under the terms of the Section 106 planning obligation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just again, to say, again, to be slightly boring, there is no planning application up here. It's literally just the yeah. operation of the bank. Uh, the second two scenarios, so this middle two scenario is a development providing its gains on site or on another site coming forward at the same time as the planning application that's controlled by the applicant. Do we have pre-application? Well, yes, please. I think you, I think all majors, you would encourage pre-application anyway. Alongside the application, and this is where I think we're going beyond the statutory minimum information requirements. And we're going to talk about that a bit more when we go into some of our hot topics, because it's taken us a while to get to this point. But I think I'm confident saying out loud in public, this is what you would need to have at point of application. So it's the heads of terms of the section 106 explaining how you're going to look after the habitat and a draft biodiversity gain plan. While you're determining the planning application. Post consent, you get the official version, the proper version of the biodiversity game plan, because according to the. The act, you can't see it until the day after you've issued a consent, so you're talking about a draft game plan and then this is the proper game plan. Yeah, and then you do carry out monitoring enforcement as per the section 106 or as per the condition if it's on site and if it's off site, as you were saying, it has to be secured by the section 106, so you've got no choice in the second one of those two. And then lastly, you've got sites that are buying uh, their. Units, units. <laughs> uh, they're buying their units. So to some extent, do you, do you need to have a big tizzy about pre-application stage about BNG? Um, probably not. Probably what you would want to see, and I think some councils are building this into their local validation checklist, you would want to have some sort of statement about how you're going to approach biodiversity or ecology or something like that to explain you know, in in headline terms, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> here's what we think we can do on site. Here's the balance that we're going to try to go off site. And either we have, you know, we found a local market and we're going to do like this, or we haven't yet found a local market, but, you know, and some sort of statement of intent possibly. Then after consent, you get the biodiversity game plan. I think the and it's a very similar story for for three B, which is when you're using national credit backstop. I think the two points that I'd make, and I don't know that people will agree me with on this, is one is I think at the point of making a planning consent, I don't think that you can say we'll consent if it's units, but not if it's credits. I just don't think that planning of planning committees will have that discretion, that power, or at least not without doing quite a lot of preparatory sort of policy work first. <clears throat> and I think the other thing that people don't agree with, with is that in this scenario where you're buying in your units slash credits, I think that's what, what I might do from now on is just use both. Yeah, units slash credits, good plan. I don't think there is a section 106. I don't think there is monitoring and enforcement because actually what you've basically doing in your biodiversity game plan is providing kind of proof of purchase I've bought this yeah. stuff from this bank. And that's the only kind of check that you need, really, because the oper the proper operation of the bank is dealt with up here in scenario one. And if the bank says we're going to have these units of these types of habitats and they don't because it's all dead or whatever, it's up for the person on the other end of the legal agreement in scenario one to decide what to do about it. Yeah, exactly. 
I think there's probably some questions that we will get into and we bet we may this may be our first update of this or a later update around what comes in at biodiversity game plan stage and what is in the metric at that stage as well and and how that needs to cover um what the for example the bank's putting in there and that sort of thing um but at the moment um yeah i think it th th yeah that, that uh, but that doesn't really relate so much to the monitoring and enforcement but it relates particularly to that post consent stage what exactly are you going to see um, because in theory, you need to have some stuff in the metric to, to show how it's all working um, and you might need to check that. Um, so, um, yeah, but um, we can we will get into the detail of pre that. Pre-development and post-development values, is that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So but we'll get into that in sort of a more of a deep, you know, when we cover our sort of deep dive sessions, I think it's not to sort of cover here, but I think it's important about the monitoring and enforcement because it's already covered um at it, at it under another scenario so essentially you'd be asking for the same information twice or through you know whoever is I, I guess another important point to bring up here and apologies if we've we're sort of covering this later is you may not be the owner of the section 106 in 1a um it yes. may be that it's outside your local authority area um now so so that's quite an interesting one and and actually under this scenario 3a that's okay it's being managed by somebody else you don't need to worry um because we do get a lot of questions about sort of cross you know what what, what about if the local uh, the off-site bng is 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 in a different local authority area there's a different scenario under 2b on that i recognize because it is through the planning application and we will get into that with our examples, but I think it's important to note that in that scenario, it probably doesn't matter that it's outside your LPA because it's under a, a different, it's, it's, you know, it's not related to the planning application in your section 106. It's a different agreement. You know, it's an obligation different. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I've heard people saying if they're providing it and it's over there, how can I, in, how can I monitor and how can I enforce it if it's on mm. someone else's patch? Yeah. And the answer is you don't. You don't need under three A, you don't. You you will need to under two B, but we can get into that in detail later. Yeah, I have to say there are some people who don't agree with this, but I think no. that's fine. Um, yeah. This for we'll me... get there in the end, Rich. We'll persuade them all <laughs> exactly. that that we're right. It's usually the way. So this this for me is a really kind of important part of our kind of yeah, our kind of learning model, teaching model. Yes. Uh, if you if this is where I'm now talking to the audience, if you if you don't agree with it, if you think that we're wrong, that's brilliant. Uh, you can help to make this better. Um, I think in the short term, we're going to be putting this these videos around our network and I'm expecting some kind of debate afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and if we are proven that we're wrong or if actually there's a better teaching model that helps people understand yeah. how these things work, we can scrub all this and start again because it might be the first time, would it, Ben? No, it will not, definitely not be the first time. So, yeah, do let us know. So I think in summary, as we end scenarios and end this video, it feels very much like doing a podcast now, doesn't it? I know. See it's quite week. exciting. <laughs> so um, we've got these swim lanes. I think they're helpful to understand how uh, BNG works within the swim lane. Um, there is this hierarchy that you were talking about earlier, Becky, where there is this, you know, preference for on-site, second preference off-site, last preference national. So I think, um, is it going to happen that applications are only ever going to be in one lane? Probably not. I think we can expect to see a mix. I think a mm -hmm. bit of on-site and a bit of off-site is going to be a really kind of common occurrence. But to, in my view, having this kind of this bedrock of understanding of these scenarios helps you confidently navigate well this bit we're going to do over here because of this and this bit we're going to do under that swim lane because of that and with that I think we're going to end unless there's anything you want to say yeah no I think that's it so we will um post a separate video and cover the hot topics and uh a worked example so that's it for now let me stop this